Hello and welcome to my review of Riders Republic. All the gameplay in this video was captured on a PlayStation 5 console, but the game's also available for all other consoles except the Switch and it's on PC as well. Remember, if you enjoy the video or find it useful, please do consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this. So what is Riders Republic? Well, it's an open-world extreme sports game developed by Ubisoft, and it works on a live service system. The game's set in what is essentially an amalgamation of various national parks, which you can explore however you want. The team that developed the game used actual GPS data from real-life national parks and stitched them all together to create one sort of huge, seamless open world. You can race and explore this world in a variety of ways, including things like bikes, snowboards, and even jetpacks. Most of the races aren't played on what you would call man-made tracks. Instead, the game uses the natural rock formations, hills, and slopes to create the tracks that you race on. To help keep all of the participants in line, lots of checkpoints are placed along the track that you'll need to hit on your way to the finish line. The game doesn't really feature much of a story for its career mode, but once you've created your character from some basic options and dropped into the world, the only thing you really need to know is that you play as a rookie who's being mentored by one of the greatest racers of all time, who's recently retired from extreme sports to run a food truck. But once he sees your potential, he's very quick to take you under his wing and make you his protege. From time to time, some of the characters will pop up to teach you something or tell you about an event that's going on, but after the initial hour or so, there really isn't much for them to do. Gameplay-wise, you'll be traveling all over the map and racing in events that take you to huge mountains, dusty deserts, lush woodland, and snowy slopes. The goals of each event depend on its type, and these can range from simply placing first to the highest trick score to beating certain times and many more variants besides. Some of the events even force you to switch between different sports during the race at specific intervals. For example, you could be racing on a mountain bike and then once you hit a certain checkpoint, you'll fly off the mountain and suddenly switch to a wingsuit, which then allows you to fly down the mountain and then hit another checkpoint that instantly switches you back to your bike or perhaps a snowboard depending on where you are. Each activity like the bike racing, snowboard freestyle or wingsuits all have their own career progression. As you complete the events within these sports, you'll earn XP which levels up that specific career. This also unlocks new events for that career and rewards you with some new gear. The gear itself is what you race on like bikes or skis, and the color is coded for its quality. Each piece has its own stats and an overall rating. Green is for standard gear, while blue is for pro, and so on. The gear in the game cannot be upgraded or visually customized in any way, and it just is what it is. Your rider's clothes, however, can be customized and serve as this game's cosmetics. These cosmetics are sometimes handed out to you as a reward, but most of the time, you'll be buying them from the rotating stock on offer at the in-game shop. The shop takes two types of currency, the first of which is called Bucks, and it's the game's standard currency that you get from simply playing the game. The second type is called RC, which is only available for people who want to spend real money. As of the recording of this review, there is absolutely no way to earn this currency in-game, and some cosmetics can only be purchased using RC, effectively locking some items off for people who aren't willing to pay more. The game also offers a Year 1 Pass, which was available for purchase on Day 1 of the game's release. It costs over £30, or around $50. US dollars. Occasionally, as you play the game, you'll be alerted that a mass race is starting soon. This is basically a limited-time public event where many real-life players can gather at a certain point to race each other. You still only get bucks and XP for taking part, and it does get more than a little messy. Just think about the game Fall Guys, but on bikes, and you'll be pretty close. With the exception of mass races, when you enter any event on the map, you can choose to race against ghosts of other players or against actual live players from around the world. Racing the ghosts is a much more stable gameplay experience, whereas racing against real players seems to create some issues for the netcode. This in turn creates instability and unpredictability for the online races. On top of the progression system for each sport, there's also two other types of progression, stars and sponsors. Stars are awarded for completing events and then for completing various side objectives within those events. They could be something like earn a certain amount of points, do a specific trick without falling, or place first in a race without using the game's rewind feature. The rewind feature, as the name suggests, allows you to rewind time at the push of a button if you happen to go flying off the side of a mountain. But everyone else in the race is completely unaffected by the rewind, so you can't really rely on it. The sponsor system allows you to unlock and equip up to three sponsors, which all have tasks for you to complete that will rank up that sponsor. Completing the tasks and ranking up the sponsor provides you with some cosmetic items and gear for your troubles, which are often marked with that sponsor's logo. In regards to the controls and options in the game, there's a lot to mess around with. You have two main control types, Racer and Trickster. Racer gives you full control over the camera and allows you to flip and spin using
using the face buttons on your controller. Trickster, on the other hand, locks the camera behind you and allows you to perform flips and spins with the right stick. You can even set the game to control a lot like Ubisoft's previous extreme sports title, Steep, if you want to. I've not played Steep myself, but I've heard that the Steep controls in Riders Republic aren't exactly the same, but they are pretty close. After you've found your preferred control style, there's also a ton of things to consider in the options menus like sensitivity, auto landing for tricks, and tons of accessibility options should you need them. If you decide to go for the auto landing assistance for the tricks, the game will 9 times out of 10 land any trick that you try to do and either rotate or flip the correct amount of time so you can't crash that easily. The trade-off is that you don't have full control over your tricks and you won't get any bonus points for them. Of course, if you decide to turn it off, you'll have full control so the most skilled players can do some insane combos and gain bonus points as they do so. As you see here, the game's map is rather large and it's covered with a lot of things to do and find. There are vistas for you to discover and collectible relics which work a little bit like special pieces of gear. For example, I found this crashed plane at one point and it gave me this jet engine relic to fly around with. I mean, yeah, you can't use it in races or anything, but it's really handy for the open world and very quickly became the best way to get to any event. This stunt challenge in Sequoia Forest will provide a massive hit of adrenaline as you take on the big trees. Remember. There's a few other minor things to mention, like the 6v6 trick battle arena that has you and your team trying to score more points than your opponents by doing as many tricks as you can. And of course, you can play with friends in a group, and you can even create your own tracks and courses which can then be uploaded by you and downloaded by another member of the community. And so at this point, you should have a pretty decent idea of what this game's about and how it works, so let's move on to the personal opinion section, starting with the positives. As always, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just stuff that really stood out to me, and the the same is true for the negative section. So first of all, I think I need to explain something. As many of you may know, I played the recent Trial Week demo of Riders Republic and made a video about it. I didn't come away from that demo with a positive impression of the game, and for the first time on my channel since I started doing YouTube, my opinion on the game seemed to be very much in the minority. I actually even cancelled my pre-order and wasn't even going to review the game at that point. So then I did something that I feel a lot of YouTubers don't do often enough. I actually listened. I went into that comment section and I spoke to a lot of you about why I hadn't enjoyed the game. There were some great suggestions for me about the controls, and some of you made some very good points, and most importantly, you all did it in a friendly and respectful way. I really can't ask for more than that, especially on the internet. So I did what I felt was fair, and I decided to buy and review the game after all. And what can I say after 25 hours worth of play? Well, I kind of get it now. I understand what makes the game so enjoyable and why so many people are playing it and singing its praises. I still have some of the same issues I had with it before, but I definitely found some things to like as well. There are times when everything is just working the way it should, and you're speeding down the side of a mountain on a bike, hitting huge jumps, and for the most part, not slamming into giant rocks or trees. The game just feels and looks great during these moments. Moments, and that, in my opinion, is where the fun begins and ends. Luckily though, virtually all you do in the game is race, so the fun parts are in fact very frequent. Performance-wise, it ran very well indeed on PS5. The frame rate was a stable 60fps, the resolution was at 4K, so everything looked very clean and crisp, and I guess besides getting stuck in the geometry from time to time, there weren't really any bugs to speak of. Not to mention the loading times were almost instant, maybe a few seconds at most, and I only had one hard crash during the entire playthrough. It's also not a bad looking game in my opinion, I mean, yeah, it's an Ubisoft open world, but it definitely doesn't have the detail of something like Assassin's Creed or Far Cry. Thing is though, I don't think it's really supposed to. There's very little in the way of buildings because it's based on national parks, so while the map may not look that impressive, I think its design, layout, and graphical fidelity work very well for this specific game. The character models are fine, I suppose, although they're definitely stuck in the previous generation, but then again, this is basically a PS4 or Xbox One game with a few minor tweaks to performance for PS5 and Series X, so it is understandable. I will say I was quite impressed by the sheer amount of stuff to do and the variety of that stuff. There's just so much to do that at times it feels like it's never going to end, and you know, you can probably take that as a good or bad point. Point, but for me, it was definitely a positive. I did really enjoy bouncing from one event to the next while occasionally switching the type of event I was doing to keep things feeling fresh. Plus, the game is a live service, so I would imagine there'll be even more to come in the future, although you'll probably have to pay for it. And speaking of paying for it, that brings me neatly along to the negative section. So in this section, I'll be upfront and say, I dislike this game more than I like it. 
When I played the demo, I just didn't get it at all. I didn't like it, and as I said, I even cancelled my pre-order. However, after spending nearly 25 hours with the full game, I understand it, I really do, and I get why a lot of other people like it. I was definitely able to find quite a lot of enjoyment in this game, even though I don't really like it that much. So firstly, let's talk about my biggest problem with the game, the controls and the handling. When I uploaded the video about the demo, I had one viewer say that the controls would feel better once I got higher quality gear, because the higher stats on that gear would improve the performance of handling of, let's say, a bike, for example. That's something I didn't even think of when I made that video, and that viewer was 100% correct. I did manage to get some really good bikes, and the handling was definitely better, but even though I could feel the difference, it still didn't feel good to me to play. It still felt unresponsive and slow, albeit a little bit less than before. I found this really hard to explain in my last video, but I saw another review earlier and it explained it perfectly. It was a review by the Australian YouTuber SkillUp, who seemed to have exactly the same issues as I did. So I'll leave a link to his review in the description if you're interested in watching that. But basically, he was talking about how the game has an issue with the dead zone on your controller. The game would often require some pretty precise inputs and due to the large dead zones on your analog sticks, you simply couldn't make those small inputs without overcorrecting. I honestly felt like I was fighting with the controller controls for my entire playthrough. Having said that though, sometimes things felt great on a big wide open track with lots of space, but in a lot of the races it just didn't feel fun at all. I also played around with all of the control options and tested out each one over the course of a few hours. I tried Trickster, Racer, the steep controls as well as tweaking sensitivities and messing with the auto landing system. Literally everything I could change, I did change, and I just could not find a system or setting that felt right or fun to use. I ended up settling for the Racer type with the auto landing enabled, as I just seemed to gravitate towards it during my testing. Probably not the best way to play the game, but you know, it helped me get through the game so that's something. Another thing that kind of annoyed me was the physics in the game. They can just be so unpredictable and sometimes just plain wrong. This is really noticeable in the mass races, which are a total mess at the beginning. You just end up bumping into everything and everyone and you simply cannot see where you're going. I did a lot of these and it was always the same. I could never get anywhere near first place and after doing maybe, I don't know, 20 of them perhaps, I just gave up playing them. The same is true for the smaller stunt events that have you working your way around a difficult and very thin course on a bike. They are absolutely infuriating for me and I was never able to complete a single one. The way that the physics, controls and handling work together just creates this feeling of why am I bothering with this, you know? I said this in my trial week video but I'm not an angry gamer. I've never broken or thrown a controller because of a game and the worst I've ever done, I think, is shut down the console and just walk away and do something else. But honestly, this game's physics are just so annoying to me that I did occasionally feel really irritated by it. But as I always say, that's just me, you know, you may feel differently. Perhaps I just suck at the game, that could definitely be it. But I have seen a lot of other people say the same thing, so I really don't know what to think in that regard. And this last point is one I know you saw coming, the monetization. Now look, I get that some people aren't bothered by microtransactions or even predatory business practices, and that's fair. You're under no obligation to care about it, and it's your money, so do as you please. However, I'm giving my personal opinions here, and in my view, this game's monetization is frankly disgusting. Genuinely one of the worst examples I've ever seen. Not the worst, but it's definitely up there. First two currencies, Bucks and RC. Bucks are given out very slowly and RC is only purchasable with real money with absolutely no way at all to earn it in the game. They use the same tried and tested trick of making the amount that you can buy slightly less or slightly more than you need to try and manipulate you into buying the bigger bundle. I saw a lot of stuff for around, what, 1500 RC, something like that, but you can only buy RC in lots of 1050 or 2300, which pushes people towards the more expensive one. I guess we should be lucky it doesn't have loot boxes or any kind of loot box system, and that you can just buy whatever you want from the store, but as I've always said, the stuff that's for sale in the shop should just be in the game from the beginning, not sold separately. If this game was free to play, which I kind of think it could be, I could almost understand it. Even though I don't like free to play business models, the company has to make some money somewhere for the game to exist. But charging full price for this game and then having this kind of monetization on top is just ridiculous. I personally didn't really like any of the cosmetics anyway, except for the one you see me wearing in the gameplay, and that's only because it had a duck mask. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, there's also a year one pass available on day one for about £33 or I think around $50, which gives you some cosmetics over time and a new event type, which was the BMX bikes, I believe. It's just absolutely unacceptable in my world, and I simply will not support it. 
If you're the kind of person who does, then as I said, it's your money and I'm not going to tell you what to do with it. That's not my place. However, for anyone that does support this kind of thing, let me ask you something. Wouldn't you prefer to not pay the extra $50 for the year one pass and just have that content be in the game that you already paid for? Or do you literally just want to give them an extra 50? I know that sounds really sarcastic, but I'm not trying to be. I'm just genuinely curious as to your thinking. And that about does it for the negative, so let's move on to the conclusion and recommendation section. In my personal view, Riders Republic can be a really fun time with the right conditions, but it can also be an absolute nightmare without them. At the end of the day, it's a huge open world with a metric ton of stuff to do and collect. Plus, there's quite a bit of genuine enjoyment to be found if you take the time to learn the game like I did. Ultimately though, I think it's going to come down to the controls. I think that's what will make or break this game for anyone who plays it. I actually did a load of research looking at what people thought of the game's controls from the beta and the launch of this game, and I've basically seen opinions split down the middle. People either seem to love them and, you know, pre-ordered the game immediately or bought the game immediately, and others hated them and instantly dropped the demo or the game within an hour. It's a really difficult one to gauge, but as I said, I think it's going to come down to whether or not you like the controls and handling. And if you take the monetization out of the equation, I think I would still recommend the game if you're already interested in it. But for people who aren't too sure about it, I would just personally skip it for now. Just keep in mind that I'm someone who didn't actually like the controls and that really brought it down for me, so take that into account if you're on the fence regarding a purchase. At the end of it all though, I'm really glad that I took the time to listen to viewer feedback and decided to play the game after all. I understand it now, and even though I don't personally like it that much, I just can't deny its good parts. And so there you go, that's my review of Riders Republic. It's available right now for all consoles except the Switch, and it's on PC as well. Bit of a shame this one, I was hoping that if I put in enough time and effort I would grow to love it, but it is what it is I suppose. If you have any questions or perhaps there was something I missed that you'd like to know about, please feel free to leave a comment and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you enjoyed the video or found it useful, I hope today will be the day that I earn your subscription, and if you want to support the channel even further, all the important links are in the video description down below. But with all that said, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.